He asked me, do I know about the Gilgo Beach murders? And of course I do. I'm pretty sure there's a multi-part episode on Crime Junkie. And I'm like, yeah, of course I know. And he goes on to tell me, yeah, that's a serial killer that was never caught in my hometown. That was someone who came across the accused killer in a, in a work setting. They were in a group, and, and she had this really awkward conversation. We're going to take some uh, time in this segment to talk about this accused serial killer and his interactions and relationships with women. Okay? This is Nikki Brass. This is someone, she says she dated him, and she's an, I believe she's an escort, but they sort of dated. Here she is describing this man. What did you think when you first saw him? Oh, my God, he's massive. At the time, I was, you know, 24 years old. I was like 120, 130 pounds, hadn't, you know, hadn't had kids yet. And he was a gigantic man. Like, I had to look up at him, gigantic. And it wasn't just his height, it was his weight, it was everything. He was just this huge, very, like, overbearing type mm. of weight. Like, he almost carried his weight to intimidate. Mm. And what was he like when you were sitting across the table from him? Um, so before we sat down, he shook my hand, which I just have to say, there is no reason to have a handshake that firm. Like, <laughs> <laughs> he, he, had a, he had a really strong hand for sure. Yeah, like I get, I get that firm handshake to show confidence. Right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But his was like... Like, aggress like, 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 a, her, like an aggressive you. grip. Wow. You know what I mean? Other than that, he seemed normal. He seemed like... He told me, hey, well, uh, well, first of all, right when we sat down, I said hi. It's nice to meet you. My real name's Nikki. Mm -hmm. And he just said Rex. He didn't give me a last name or anything. Mm -hmm. We sat down. He seemed perfectly normal at first. He seemed like your typical guy who was bored with his life, you know, mm -hmm. and wanted some kind of excitement. It didn't get weird until he asked me if I was a true crime fan. Wait a minute, he asked you if you were a true crime fan. He asked if I was a true crime fan, and I am. Like, uh -huh. I am a, I'm a serial killer buff. I won't even lie. I, uh -huh. It was when he said, well, do you know about the Gilgo Beach, the Gilgo Beach murders? He actually brought it up. Yeah, he said, so he has said to me exactly, do you know about the Gilgo Beach murders? And I was like, yeah, I'm from Long Island. Everybody from Long Island knows about them, you know what I mean? Um, and that's when he started talking about it. But here's the thing. When he brought it up, his whole demeanor changed. It, it, he, he sat up straighter, you know. He had, like, a smirk on his face. He seemed almost, like, too excited to talk about it. And then once he did start talking about it, it didn't seem like a true crime fan who just knows information they've seen on TV or read. Mm -hmm. It seemed like somebody who was reliving it. One, one thing I remember specifically was he said to me, how do you think they get rid of the bodies without going noticed? And I said, I have no clue. I've never been to Gilgo Beach. I don't know the access points. Like, I couldn't tell you anything about it. I've, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. And he said, what if they treaded through the marsh the, with the burlap sacks? You would never see them. Uh, he's like, it's a very dark and desolate area. Wow. Okay, let's dive into all of this. Let's bring in our guests in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, Professor of Forensic Psychology, Dr. Catherine Ramsland. Also, also with us in Orlando, Florida, psychotherapist, CEO of Life, Life Counseling Solutions, Dr. Janie Lacey. And in Las Vegas, Nevada, serial killer expert, criminologist, author of the book, Why We Love Serial Killers, Dr. Scott Bond, back with us as well. <laughs> Great to see everyone. Uh, Dr. Catherine Ramsland, what we just heard from two different women, two different settings. One, they're on a date. Another, it's kind of in a work setting, but he loves apparently talking to women about the Gilgo Beach uh, murders. Well, it's a fantasy. It's a very, it's probably something he has a hard time keeping to himself. Uh, he wants to brag, but he doesn't want to give himself away. And potentially, these, because these were small women, potentially he was considering them to be victims. He might have been thinking of inviting them over 
and per perhaps putting them into a position of vulnerability, but certainly he wanted them to think that he had a lot of confidence in this area and he understood the mind of this killer himself. Chilling, Dr. Janie Lacey, extremely chilling. What, what struck you about the description of, of the date? What struck me is hearing her story, it's almost as if we're hearing his voice through her, that he was taking this pride in his um, murders and a sense of almost connecting with her over that by even asking her those questions about um, as she had an interest in crime. And the fact that she probably was a little bit intimidated as she expressed his height and these types of things. You know, if there was a pattern of women that he would attach to or be attracted to or would be the target of his uh, crime and she fit that, that would probably give us some insight to his interactions with some of these women. Dr. Scott Bond, it's, it's almost cliche. It's almost cliche, right? They're like, hey, did you hear about those kill Like, I've seen that in a movie. I've seen that on a show where the killer loves talking about the killer, but I guess it, it's, it's real life. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, as I listen to the clip and as we learn more and more about this guy, uh, very little of it is actually surprising. I mean, this, this is a control freak at every level probably a psychopath, probably a malignant narcissist, and he likes to tease and torment. It's almost like a cat with a mouse, and he seems to do it in all of his interactions. And um, and so this, yeah, he was just uh, playing a game with this woman. And, um, and the, you know, his size, his stature again, and the fact that he tends to target a smaller women, it's all about power, control, and domination. Now, speaking of, again, his relationship with women, um, fascinating piece in New York Magazine, uh, My Boss the Monster uh, by Mary Schell, and this goes back to 2007. She says, when I first met him in his Midtown office, his face turned red like that of a shy teenage boy who had been surprised by a hot girl in the cafeteria. Even sitting behind his desk, he looked to me like a giant. His office was mostly staffed by women like myself, young and petite, the girl next door type. We knew he was married with a family in Massapequa, but he never spoke of them. Dr. Janie Lacey, what do you think of that? Well, there's a couple of things that come to mind. First, there's this compartmentalization that we heard if he never spoke about his family and entered them into his everyday world. And then also my mind goes back to what was he experiencing as a young person? Was he rejected by women? Was he recreating a certain scenario almost um, by bringing certain types of women around when we're hearing her, her story as she was sharing her impression of him? That's what some of my initial thoughts were. Dr. Scott Bond, I wanna to add to this something we were talking about in the first segment, which is, you know, um, perhaps an overbearing mother, a big part of his life. He, he ends up living in the house he grew up in we know it's dilapidated. We know it's a mess inside. It's cluttered. Um, now he goes off to work from, from that environment, and he's surrounded by young, petite, pretty women. Right. Well, it's, again, as my colleague just said, it's compartmentalization. And is it possible that he had to use the, you know, the vernacular mommy issues? Maybe he did. Uh, I've actually heard some, you know, mostly hearsay allegations that he had a troubling relationship with his mother and that she was very domineering. Um, so just like Ed Kemper, you know, mommy may, may become a target. And uh, there was some, you know, resentment toward uh, women going on here. But clearly he has a type. Uh, clearly it is these small, petite women. Um, but yeah, there could be a pathology there where there is some resentment toward women that was being acted out um, through his fantasies and his killings. Okay, Dr. Catherine Ramslin, I, I hate to uh, do this to you. Um, uh, I'm going to give a verbal warning to everyone at home. Um, some of the stuff I can't even say, you'll see it up on the screen. We're talking about his internet searches. Um, Girl begging for rape porn. Short fat girl tied up porn. 10 year old blonde hair girl. Torture redhead porn. Black girl, 10 years old. Old janitors, not gonna say it, you can read it, little school girl. 
crying teen porn. So let's, let's take up those searches and add it to the fact of the description of the people he surrounded himself in his office with. Young and petite. What are you seeing well, now? I, I think these young women make him feel very insecure. They throw him off. And the way that he can get power back is to hire them and not only have them in his office where they are beholden to him paying them and they have to do what he says, but also the stories were that he would come in and talk about his hunting trips and sometimes would really creep them out. And he enjoyed, he seemed to really enjoy that. He's a bully and he's a sadist. I, I'm still trying to figure out, Dr. Scott Bond, like he was an architect. He's got his own firm for years. He, he bought a house from his mother, so he got it really cheap. He didn't spend any money on that house. What do you what do you think's going on in his life with all the with all the money? Is he spending it all on escorts? Well, we know he's he bought a lot of guns. He apparently had two to three hundred guns, so that's an interesting thing, which is a bit of an aberration when it comes to serial killers like this, because I'm sure he was a, a strangler. Um, and the, it, so that's you know that is a bit of an aberration. But you know, people have been asking how why why the dilapidated house? Why is his wife on food stamps driving a dilapidated car? And yet he had a relatively successful business. And I think that the answer could get, come back to compartmentalization again, where he focused his meticulous nature, his organized, precise nature that other people describe, where he, in the area of his job itself, which requires great precision, being an architect, and then being the organized psychopathic serial killer that he apparently was, you need great precision there as well. So I think that's where he focused his meticulous nature. Other things just didn't matter, you know? Let the house go to heck. You know, let the, the family is not very important. I'm gonna focus my resources, my time, and my energy where it gives me pleasure, my job, and then killing. 